he strived to give a platform of those often underrepresented in the mainstream media. Uh, as you could see, we have a very uh, uh, different uh, panelists from the government, international organization, NGOs, and uh, we also have the European Union representative, I think, we, we, and also in academia. Then I think we have a pretty, uh, we'll have got a pretty, uh, uh, let's say, broad uh, information about the, the topic that we today trying to explore. Uh, my first questions go to Her, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Natalia Alvarez. And my question is, uh, why Costa Rica can talk about migration and youth? Uh, can you tell us a little bit, especially about youth uh, employment and labor perspectives in Costa Rica? Please. Thank you. Uh, buenos días a todos uh, y a todas. Es un gusto estar aquí. Saludos a los otros panelistas. Um, bueno, sí, para tener claro por qué Costa Rica puede hablar de migraciones eh, y juventud. Y tecnologías. Bueno, Costa Rica es un país de 51.100 kilómetros cuadrados. Tenemos eh, ahí el 5% de la biodiversidad del mundo y eh, tenemos también a nivel panorámico y escenarios, tenemos prácticamente todo menos nieve. Y a nivel de población, tenemos una población indígena originaria nuestra, tenemos población descendiente europea, tenemos población afrodescendiente, tenemos muchas comunidades chinas y recientemente muchas otras. Esto significa que somos diversidad, no solo biodiversidad, sino, biodiver sino diversidad en las personas y nos asumimos como tales, siendo un país multietnico y pluricultural. Eh, además, tenemos un 10% de la población con documentos eh, como migrantes, pero... Además, las ONGs hablan de un 7 a 10 por ciento adicional, datos que no tenemos, lo cual coincide con las tendencias mundiales, de población migrante en condición irregular. Esto significa para Costa Rica entre un 17 y un 20 por ciento de población migrante en el país, lo cual lo hace uno de los más grandes, una tasa de los más grandes del mundo. Eh, adicional a esto, eh, bueno… Tenemos retos para esta regularización de personas y creemos que las tecnologías son justamente un mecanismo para ello. Después volveremos al tema. Eh, y hay un dato que quiero enfatizar y es que Costa Rica eh, abolió el ejército en el año 1948. Eh, hemos vivido así y por, lo, por tanto no existe para Costa Rica una opción represiva para la migración. No existe ninguna alternativa que no se base en mecanismos administrativos, en gestión ordenada y segura de las migraciones. Eh, y, por tanto, tampoco es la devolución de las personas una alternativa válida dentro de nuestro sistema institucional e idiosincrasia. Eh, por lo cual, además, reiteramos um, un sistema de derecho en el que las personas migrantes, todas eh, en su condición de trabajadores o trabajadoras, tienen todos los derechos eh, laborales, independientemente de su condición migratoria. Y es de esto también somos ampliamente respetuosos. Eh, Costa Rica pues, ha suscrito y promueve el Pacto Global de las Migraciones y muchos otros instrumentos internacionales. Ahora, eh, ¿cuál es la dinámica de la, de la migración al interno de Costa Rica y cuáles son algunas de nuestras particularidades? Eh, a diferencia de otros países de la región, Costa Rica cuenta principalmente con una migración intrarregional eh, y fundamentalmente somos receptores de migración. Entonces, eh, si vemos, por ejemplo, las caravanas en el norte de Centroamérica, eh, difícilmente hay personas ahí panameñas, costarricenses o nicaragüenses, porque existe un flujo en el lado sur de Centroamérica que, digamos, es autónomo. Y dentro de esto, más o menos el 43% de la población eh, trabajadora en Costa Rica es no… Na, perdón, la, un 43% de la población en, condi, en edad de trabajar de la población migrante es un 43%. Eh, nuestra, nuestro rango de población joven es de 15 a 35 años. Entonces, eh, de las personas que trabajan, que tienen esta edad para trabajar, eh, ese 43% se considera joven en Costa Rica. 
eh, lo cual implica también muchas presiones en cuanto al mercado laboral, eh, que además en este momento lamentablemente tenemos una situación eh, de, crecimiento, de desaceleración económico y tenemos un desempleo del 12%. No obstante esto, eh, ¿cuál es el perfil de las personas que están en Costa Rica? Bueno, eh, fundamentalmente población migrante nicaragüense y panameña y recientemente venezolana. Eh, del año 2014 a hoy, las aplicaciones para refugio en Costa Rica, las solicitudes eh, han aumentado en un 2.000%. 2.000% dadas la situación política de Venezuela y de Nicaragua, eh, entonces esto también pues, se hace un reto importante para el país. Eh, y la población panameña migrante que llega a Costa Rica es, tiene otra particularidad y es que son indígenas de la comarca Nove Uglé y tienen una migración circular que va y viene prácticamente todos los años muy vinculada con la agricultura, con el café específicamente y en algunas zonas con el banano. De todo esto, eh, también que es algo importante para, para destacar y es justamente que en esta población tenemos adicionales retos en el acceso y uso de tecnologías dados estos perfiles. Entonces, el país tiene, ha generado también una serie de mecanismos para poder acercarse a ellos y poder acercar los mecanismos de regularización. Eh, recientemente pues hemos generado algunos donde las citas se pueden sacar mediante call center para generar un mecanismo eh, bien ordenado y pues algunas otras eh, iniciativas específicas que hacen uso de las tecnologías. Eh, también podemos hablar posteriormente sobre el mercado laboral y cuáles son algunas de las estrategias que hemos venido diseñando. Eh, entendiendo que en Costa Rica también tenemos una economía que está como en dos extremos. Por un lado estamos muy vinculados a la agroindustria, por el otro lado estamos muy vinculados con la economía del conocimiento y también con eh, eh, al, componentes digitales y otras industrias de alto densidad y de alto conocimiento, para lo cual tenemos que cumplir con ese gap. Y la visión con respecto a la migración es que si, los, si nos consideramos totalmente eh, diversos, si estamos acogiendo a esta población y la estamos con, acogiendo en todo el aspecto de sus derechos, consideramos que las tecnologías van a ser un excelente aliado no solo para su inserción en el mercado laboral, sino para generar esta masa crítica que necesitamos para mantener una ventaja competitiva en la que nos hemos posicionado desde hace algún tiempo en términos productivos. Thank you, Excellency. We have heard why is actually youth immigration, and uh, of course we listen after about how technology is used in, in, in Costa Rica, but now we also need to listen about internationalization and uh, Mr. Zhao. Uh, who is Secretary General of ITO, uh, I would like to ask you the question on uh, information and communication technologies have been reshaped our lives, economics and social interactions, influencing every aspect of migration. As the lead UN agency for ICTs, what is the ITU doing to help young migrants benefit from those technologies? Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, if, uh, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm very pleased to join you this morning at this important meeting on the immigration. You introduced me to the party participants that is my second term. It's true, it's second term. But you have not introduced to them what I've done the first term. Actually, the, my first term started from 2015. And my first visit as Secretary General of ITU to visit my UN sister organization is IOM. I visit uh, my dear colleague, uh, William uh, Swing, and uh, in early January 2015, when I just started my uh, role as Secretary General. Uh, there are two reasons. One reason is that because he's quite a senior of our young colleagues, but secondly, I consider that uh, immigration has uh, the equipment challenges, and then ITU could look at the opportunity to work with IOM to see how can technologies assist our immigration. I also have another story I'd like to share with you. During my first term, 2017, I visited the Pope in his office and invited him to give us uh, some message to support ICT 
development. And then I said that uh, we still have uh, a very important part of population not connected online yet, and we'd like to encourage the investment uh, in the ICT infrastructure development, encourage the investment in the human capacity buildings of ICT skills, and to connect the people not connected yet. And a key term, yes, I do support you, and we support ICT to connect the people. And he particularly mentioned immigration, and he himself, he said uh, he was a from a family of immigration to Argentina. That, uh, he considered that the ICT could help, could help the human beings to, s to, to fight against uh, those challenges. And in particular, at that moment, we talked about uh, child immigration. And those uh, challenges, I think, that uh, is hardly uh, you know, displayed at uh, the media. And then the Pope also so his high intention to, uh, to, to, to address this issue. So I was uh, uh, very pleased to hear uh, his uh, message. And then, you know, of course, uh, he gave us a message. Uh, we delivered his message at our World uh, Telecommunication Development Conference held in Buenos Aires, uh, 2017, October. I think that the immigration is sometimes is mixed with the refugees. Uh, in my opinion, that the re uh, immigration could be uh, cover those people, group of people uh, looking for a better life, that the economic uh, immigration, technical immigration, and of course uh, some political ones as well. You know, that, uh, and uh, then you have also heard this kind of uh, legal immigration and uh, illegal immigration, and then refugees uh, somehow linked with this kind of uh, discussions. And from ITU side, uh, we highly uh, encourage our industries to find a way to support immigrant, immigrant, and particularly the young immigrant. And we know that already today, that we have a lot of uh, young people engaged with uh, ICT SMEs. And these SMEs could help them to find a job at home but could also help them to get a better life in developed areas. And later on, they may bring their technologies, skills back to their hometown, home country. So I think that the ICT could, uh, could uh, you know, work to s help immigrants. And in UN systems, uh, ITU is working very closely with uh, ILO to launch some project to help uh, uh, young people to get uh, uh, digital skills. And we worked with uh, some university like last year, the Tsinghua University and uh, uh, Geneva University launched their project to help uh, refugees in the camps with ICT to help, to help the children to get better education. So of course, uh, ITU's uh, technologies like uh, 5G we offer great opportunities for young immigrant to get uh, better adoption to the new environment or to help them to get a new career development anywhere they find uh, opportunities. And the ITU, we are have a biggest conference very soon. I actually, I'm going to Egypt uh, this weekend to get together with more than 3,000 worldwide experts for 5G, for satellite, for broadcasting, for television, for all those radio communication technologies. Because ITU is the oldest uh, young agency, but it's the only agency today in the world to take care of uh, spectrum. And uh, all the new technologies, if you want to have a wide application everywhere, you need a spectrum support. And to manage the spectrum, we, which is very limited resources, and we have our responsibilities. And we are going to Egypt. We will stay there for five weeks to fix the standard for 5G, to fix the spectrum for 5G, and uh, for satellite, for broadcasting, for television, for climate change monitoring spectrum, for public safety, used by our 
international maritime transport systems, aviation systems. So all this heavily rely on spectrum and IT will manage that one. And I'm pretty sure with uh, the good conference uh, result, many young people, particularly those uh, people from developing countries who are looking for good opportunities, could um, make the best use of these uh, new technologies to have their career developed. I, s I believe if they could uh, find a uh, good opportunity to develop their career at home, at their home country, they will not look for, for, the, for the risk to immigrate to the others. And also I believe with the new technologies, they could manage their life in the new area. They look for a better opportunity to give them opportunity to develop their career. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, I prepared my speech uh, several pages, but I don't have much time because you asked me to have a very short uh, introduction. But I have to leave you now, unfortunately, because I have another appointment. So I invited uh, one of my senior manager, uh, Kathleen Manuescu, who was uh, the boss of uh, Romania Telecom Regulatory Agency uh, some years back. And now he worked in ITU as our chief of uh, strategic department uh, uh, for strategic uh, issues. So that uh, he would uh, stay with you. And then I think that uh, if there's any questions, I think that he will be able to answer your question. And he will bring the message back to ITU for uh, our further consideration. And I'd like to take this opportunity to express my personal uh, wishes for your uh, success of this session. And uh, I'd like to assure you that ITU will continue to work with our industry members, with our administration members, with our partners from academia, from uh, NGOs, from, uh, from market to continue to work on this important issue, immigration. And then we'd like to also share with you uh, uh, news that uh, at our last uh, plenary potential conference, we did approve a, a resolution to address the issues for immigration. So that uh, I think that uh, my colleague, Katalin, will provide you more information. So, Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, once more again ask your excuse. I have to leave now. And I wish you uh, great success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhao. Uh, now, uh, now I would like to actually to continue with our discussion as we heard actually importance for the one uh, member state, we heard the importance of the, the youth and migration for the ITU and especially about how ITU can support the regular and regular migration for both through uh, 5G technology uh, spectrum and building the careers at home. Uh, now I would like uh, to ask uh, Ms. Sara Brugunov Boshkovic. Uh, on something about the data, because this is something that is, uh, I think, still, uh, uh, I will not say lacking, but it's we need to look differently. Uh, why are non-traditional data sources like social media useful to study migrations of young adults? Thank you for your introduction. Um, I present some of the work we do at the joint, at the Commission's Joint Research Center, and in specific at the Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography, uh, where we provide scientific analysis and where we manage the knowledge in order to support uh, policymakers and member states on migration and demography related issues. So we work with data on migration in our everyday uh, job. For example, uh, we made recently this publication on international migration drivers where we tried to respond on the question of why do people migrate? And we had to use a wide range of traditional data sources that come from World Bank, United Nations, OECD, Eurostat. Uh, so these were more country level data, but we use also individual level data like from the Gallup poll survey. But we uh, faced a series of limits that traditional data bring when we study migration. First of all is the timing, because uh, between the collection of data and the publication of data, there is a big time lag. And very often when the data reach the policymakers, it's already, let's say, outdated. They need the data from yesterday, basically. Uh, then second, 
we have also an issue of disaggregation. Usually the data are at the country level. If we are very, very lucky, we get the data at the regional level, but going beyond it, it's very often impossible. Then we have a problem of disaggregating data by age. That's why very often it's hard to study youth migration because simply the traditional data don't allow us to disaggregate by age. And uh, another limitation, this is just one of these limitations, is also the impossibility to capture more fluid forms of migration like circular migration, transnationalism with the traditional data, let alone to, 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 to study irregular migration with traditional data. So, uh, but of course this happens even when the statistical offices are very efficient. And uh, of course that we uh, recognize the importance of official statistics and traditional data sources, but we need also to explore non-traditional data sources and this is something that we are doing at the Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography. Uh, for example, we can use mobile phone data, we can use air passenger data, we can use social media uh, applications data, Messenger, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on. And if we want to study youth migration, then social media data becomes, uh, can be very useful because we have a high uh, penetration, high social media penetration among young populations. And this is their, let's say, preferred way of communicating. So I have some data for the EU 28. So according to the Eurostat, 60% uh, of young adults from 15 to 29 years of age use social media on daily basis in respect, for example, of uh, adults from 35 to 49 years of age where less than one third of them use social media on the daily basis. And this is a data from 2015, the last data that we have. Um, so this phenomenon probably has just increased and we have even bigger penetration of social media among the young uh, population. This is why uh, at the North Central Migration Demography, we are exploring uh, the possibility to use this type of data to improve and complement the traditional uh, data sources. Maybe later I can give you some uh, concrete details. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, the following question is going uh, towards Mr. Schwartz. Uh, based on your research, in what ways does social media contribute to negative perceptions of groups such as young migrants, and how do those negative feelings potentially lead to the hate crimes? Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and it's great to be in this session that this debates the importance of information technologies, and we have already heard how social media data basically help us or can help us to better understand the behavior of the youth. But in my research, basically, I'm focusing more also on the negative aspects social media can bring and how they can motivate hateful actions against minority groups, and uh, particularly against refugees or Muslims in the case of the U.S. we studied. And I think in my introduction, I mainly want to highlight that while social media can help us to understand those kinds of phenomena, we also have to be aware that there's a lot of misinformation circulating on social media and this is changing the beliefs of people. While social media help us to directly connect with people, they also help uh, people with sinister act, uh, motives to coordinate their actions and by social media were designed to bring together people, they're also dividing our societies up. And um, I just want to give you a brief insight into the research me and my co-author Carsten Müller now have done over the last three years. And um, I mainly want to focus here on the case of Germany where we looked at uh, the Facebook page of the far right party, the AFD, and we analyzed if we find a connection between uh, the number of anti-refugee posts on this Facebook page and the number of anti-refugee incidents. And indeed we were able to show that the number of anti-refugee incidents significantly increased in areas with higher social media use at times when we observed disproportionate amounts of social media uh, anti-refugee sentiment circulating on social media. And in further projects, we have now provided additional evidence for the US and anti-Muslim hate crime. And <coughs> we're getting more and more evidence that in line with previous findings on the polarizing effects of social media, 
these kind of sentiments that are social, uh, circulating on social media are indeed able to motivate hateful action. And um, basically, so far, our findings mainly indicate that this is the underlying salience that this is in these so-called social media echo chambers in which uh, f already radicalized people who already harbor biases against these minority groups are now overexposed to those kind of messages and thereby basically shifting their perception even further to the extreme. And this in the end is basically, according to our findings, what in the end is able basically to push those type of people over the edge and in the end uh, can lead to increases in violent action against minority groups. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have another interesting panelist, which is Mr. Nad Nadir Nagdi, and uh, I have one question then for you. As a social media activist, could you share your views on what role does the social media take in the changing the perception of youth about immigration? What are the positive and negative aspects? Uh, first, let me start by thanking the IOM and the organizers for having me today. Um, it's my great privilege and honor to be on the same panel with some of these esteemed guests. My name is Nadir. I am a YouTuber creator for Change, which is an initiative um, by YouTube and other social media platforms acknowledging creators and content creators who are using their platforms for social good. Um, for me, that is an incredible question and the crux of everything I do. I am basically a content creator trying to figure out how can I turn a very narcissistic platform and how can I leverage it into something quite socially impactful? And this has been an underlining question throughout my social media career. Um, I think it's important to understand the context of which someone like me operates. Growing up, I grew up in a space or an online world where the validity of information meant very little. I was being pulled apart by lots of different media outlets telling me one thing was true and then someone else was telling me something else was true. And a lot of young people are growing up in this context and it pulls you apart and what you have is a very polarized society in front of you. Um, this is why social media and personalities like myself have become to mean so much. Um, when we talk about why social media is so important and significant, how can some of these individuals have millions of followers around the world? Young people, instead of looking at mainstream outlets as a source of validity, have now attached their source of information from the personality. It's the personality that has become the source of information for them because they are able to craft very deep and meaningful relationships with these people because they reflect very similar things to them, personality traits or interests. So what happens is that when this individual shares a political view or a social view, they're able to relate with them on a different kind of level. And as a result of that, what you have is very deep, profound relationships from a personality to their audience. Now, a lot of my work with international organizations, people like the UN and IOM, is trying to figure out how to tap into this source of authenticity and really turn this audience from being quite politically apathetic and make them really involved and, and participants in social issues. Um, but there's plus and negatives to that. And from the, my work, I've worked in Lebanon with UNHCR. I've also worked in Myanmar with, UNH, uh, with UNH, UNDP, pardon me. There's been lots of positives and negatives from my own experience. Um, social media, when we say that, it isn't a universal term. What do we mean when we say social media? It can mean very different things in very different geographical contexts. In Myanmar, for example, a lot of the social unrest has been as a result of social media. And my work there was very stifled and, and, and it came across a lot of challenges trying to navigate that space. Facebook itself came out and said a lot of the social unrest was as, as a result of social media. So for me as a practitioner, um, someone who has a good will, someone who has an audience and a following, I have to come with a sense of humility about how do I expose my audience to very politically insensitive content. For example, somewhere like Myanmar, it's just not as easy as me coming in and being like, hey, this is the social injustices that are happening around me, and this is what we need to do. Um, but at the same time, what I represent for my audience is a level of authenticity that mainstream media would never be able to replicate. When I come in, my audience trust me as people who followed me over a period of time to come out and say something that's authentic to me that might resonate with them on a different level. So my question for different international organizations is like, when we work together, the first question for me is that, am I going to be able to operate and craft a narrative and a story through my platforms that's innate and authentic to me? 
And a lot of the times that's very difficult because international organizations and humanitarian organizations, and um, they all have their different procedures, which are safeguards to protect the validity of information, but also of people. And that's when the kind of clash between content creators and uh, international organizations can happen. I wanna make something really creative and cool that's really authentic to me, but then there's a long bureaucratic process that prevents me from doing that. So I wanted to share that with you guys today because as the only content creator on this panel, that's one of the biggest challenges I face. So my question is, how together can we work and create projects, initiatives, narratives, stories that utilize the creativity, the spontaneity, and the enthusiasm of content creators who wanna operate in this space, but also falls in line with the validity of information, but also protecting the rights of these people that we are trying to um, help. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you a lot, uh, Mr. Nagdi. I think actually you raised a couple of very important points, and this is how we can actually uh, the validate the, the data and information without having bureaucracy and mm -hmm. having actually faster pace that will reflect to the youth's need. And in that sense, I think uh, uh, further discussion, I will also speed up a little bit in the sense that I will ask two questions each of the panelists and give you six minutes uh, to 10, depends how much you'd like to share with us, uh, in order also to have a less bureaucracy but more dialogue and give also uh, uh, a little bit more space for, uh, for, uh, for uh, questions. Uh, I would like to come back to uh, Her Excellency Deputy Minister and uh, ask you uh, what is the Costa Rica vision of uh, TED, but not only that, but also what actually ministry uh, did uh, concerning youth immigration and technology, and what will be your kind of uh, uh, suggestion, recommendations to other governments uh, based on, on experience that you have in Costa Rica? Please. Gracias. Es un gran reto dar consejos. Trataremos de construirlos sobre la experiencia. Um, La visión que tenemos y que quisiera compartir acá es fundamentalmente, y tomo nota de la burocracia, es cómo la tecnología en primera instancia puede ser un vehículo para dar información a la población que está pensando en migrar, información real sobre el país, sobre las necesidades en el caso del mercado laboral, sobre los servicios, sobre la asistencia social, es decir, tener una información que pueda, que pueda ser confiable para las personas y que ayude a la toma de decisiones. En este caso tuvimos una experiencia hace tres años con el lanzamiento de una plataforma Migrant App que fue creada justamente con OIM y con mucho impulso y con mucha definición de los requerimientos por parte del gobierno de Costa Rica. Y básicamente incluía no solo eh, servicios georreferenciados, sino alguna información de país importante, justamente pensando en los flujos migratorios, en las personas que están tomando la decisión de migrar y las personas que ya lo han hecho y que se mueven a lo largo de diferentes países. Entonces, dar esta información objetiva y con, con el respaldo de que esa información gubernamental se hace muy importante. Eso en una primera etapa. Una segunda etapa es cuando la persona necesita hacer sus trámites de regularización. Y bueno, aquí debo decir que tampoco Costa Rica está en el momento perfecto, tenemos tiempos de resolución que queremos mejorar, pero estamos tomando eso también como un reto eh, y una gran mejora que queremos hacer. Y justamente aquí hemos venido trabajando en forma articulada con dos organizaciones, con OIM y con OIT, tanto en un proceso que, en el que queremos eh, mejorar no solo los trámites, porque tenemos unas características que requieren que la Dirección de Migración y el Ministerio de Trabajo generen resoluciones en forma conjunta, entonces estamos haciendo esa mejora de procedimientos eh, interestatales, Digamos, y además de eso, queremos construir un mecanismo donde usemos la biometría y la tengamos compartida para iniciar con Panamá. Entonces, nos hemos acercado y tenemos esta convicción de eh, trabajar en conjunto, trabajar articuladamente para meja, me, mejorar no solo las bases de datos, que, que esta información se hace especialmente sensible, sino también para facilitar estos procesos de regularización. 
y en términos de mercado laboral, también estamos trabajando en la generación de una plataforma que dé servicios de empleo, que incorpore también diferentes elementos vinculados con la, la población migrante. Eh, no solo en términos de accesibilidad, lo cual tiene retos de idioma, tiene otros retos eh, no solo en, en, en ese sentido, sino en cómo las personas pueden acercarse a estas plataformas tecnológicas en sus diferentes regiones. Para eso también hemos venido trabajando con la OIM generando ventanillas eh, en los diferentes municipios, especialmente en aquellos donde hay mayor población migrante y que estos puedan in interconectarse fácilmente con este servicio de empleo y evitarles a las personas no solo trámites, sino gastos y tiempo. Entonces, para estos efectos y también relacionándolo con el tema de la información objetiva, entonces, hemos estado trabajando en, una, en un análisis prospectivo del mercado de trabajo, donde estamos incorporando también el aspecto de las migraciones. Entonces, ahí queremos saber cómo nuestro mercado laboral se ajusta mejor a, las, a, a la población migrante y cuáles son esas necesidades eventuales u oportunidades según hacia dónde se está moviendo nuestra economía. Entonces, eh, insertar ahí también esta variable de la migración, pues nos hace saber con mayor certeza a dónde tenemos mejores alternativas. Todo esto partiendo de que la principal preocupación o el principal objetivo es darle oportunidades de integración en la comunidad a las poblaciones y en ese sentido, pues, eh, variarlos, no solo en términos de cuáles son los servicios que requieren estas personas, sino cómo le aportan a la economía. Para este momento, en Costa Rica sabemos que la población migrante aporta un 12% del Producto Interno Bruto y sabemos pues, que hay un gran potencial. Además, eh, el bono demográfico para Costa Rica prácticamente está pasando, entonces también económicamente descansamos un poco con las migraciones en términos de tener este bono y esta juventud que nos va a ayudar a sostener nuestra economía. Eh, algunos otros elementos es que hemos generado, justamente, básicamente en este mes, hemos generado dos diferentes mecanismos de regularización para población migrante. Uno de ellos eh, tiene que ver con el aseguramiento de la población recolectora de café, que como les decía antes, son básicamente población indígena panameña. Y entonces aquí hemos generado nuevas eh, tarjetas de identidad para estas personas eh, y un, un aseguramiento que está básicamente cubierto por eh, la organización estatal o paraestatal de los eh, exportadores del café y el Estado. Eh, no hay un cobro de este aseguramiento para las personas trabajadoras. Y otro mecanismo que recientemente se publicó es un mecanismo de aseguramiento para la población trabajar, trabajadora en el sector agrícola, que está en condición irregular. Entonces, hicimos un mecanismo con muy pocos requisitos y el cual va a trabajar, como mencionaba un poco previ previamente, eh, con eh, llamadas y citas por medio de un call center para hacerlo de una forma ordenada y también vamos a tener oficinas que van a estar eh, atendiendo a esas personas también en las regiones donde, re, donde se va a requerir. Sabemos que hay un alto porcentaje de población que está en condición irregular y este es un mecanismo en el que queremos acercarnos a ellos para mejorar su regularización, su formalización en el empleo, las, mejorar las condiciones laborales y en función de ello también haciéndolo en forma rápida y basándonos en las tecnologías de la información. Now, actually, I would like to, to ask uh, uh, Kathleen, who is uh, kindly uh, delegated with Mr. Zhao. We have another two questions for, for uh, ITU. And this is the digital technology can empower young migrants and help them integrate into the fabric of the society. But it can also threaten migrant safety, possess challenging in terms of privacy and data protection. What are your recommendations to amplify the opportunities while minimizing the risk of technology and migration? This is the first one. And second one is actually already mentioned by Mr. Zhao. In just two weeks, I too held the, the World Radio Communication Conference in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, uh, what is placed a central role in the world of technology. Uh, what can experts uh, learn from this conference and what will be the impact to the youth uh, migration? Uh, 
Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I think the, the second question, I'll start with the second question. I, say, I think Mr. Zhao, uh, in fact, explained what, uh, what is the importance of the World Radio Conference uh, <coughs> that will take place very soon in Sharm el-Sheikh. The fact that the spectrum management is uh, it's, uh, one of our main tasks and uh, the fact that uh, using or planning or developing new services uh, based on the radio uh, spectrum, uh, this may help. Uh, and I'll give you just a few examples. I think, and how, how the technology can empower the youth. It's not only the migrant, but the youth in general. One is connectivity. You, as Mr. Zhao said, uh, now more than 50% of the population is connected uh, to the internet but just with very few. Uh, uh, that means almost half of the population is not connected to the internet. One of the subjects that will be discussed in the old radio conference in, in, uh, in Egypt will be a new spectrum, new radio spectrum for uh, satellites that will allow, there are many initiatives to, for the low range satellites that will allow a better connectivity. This is one example. Coming to the other examples on connectivity, we develop different projects at the regional level or with other partners. And this is one of the most important thing to, to understand that this problem, the problems we are discussing here cannot be, cannot be solved by one country or cannot be solved by one institution. We need a multi-stakeholder model and uh, one of the main things uh, ITU has it's the, his membership, which is not only member states, we have 193 member states, but we have almost over 1,000 sector members that are coming from the private sector and academia, and we work all together to design new projects. I'll give you just two examples of, uh, of uh, activities or of projects we, are, we have developed uh, in, uh, in ITU together with other stakeholders. The first example is about uh, digital financial services. We know that uh, often the youth are excluded to the access to, to uh, formal financial services. And on one hand, we have a focus group on digital financial services in ITU trying to understand what part of these, these digital financial services can be standardized and with the participation of the industry, how we can do better. And the second one is a, a, a common initiative with the World Bank, and it's, uh, it's, it's called Financial Inclusion Global Initiative. And it's a program whose objective is to advance research in digital finance and accelerate digital financial inclusion. Uh, and here, one of the most important part is uh, how we deal with reliable identification system. One, one of the problem with use is that they cannot be identified. And we have experience in that on standardization and we, in collaboration with initiatives like ID2020 Alliance, we, uh, we, can, we are working to develop system that the people, there are almost one, mil one billion people that without a re reliable means of providing their uh, identity. Uh, Mr. Jawa spoke about uh, digital literacy and about our common project with ILO on digital skills for decent, jo decent job campaigns. And I would like to add two other projects, we, in fact, two other platforms we are offering to our stakeholder to, to uh, come together and think to a project that can first give a choice to the youth in their own country or give a choice to the youth that are migrants. The first one is about artificial intelligence. And uh, every year we are organizing here in Geneva, in this room, uh, in this, in fact, in CICG, AI for Good Global Summit. And we have participation for academ from academia, from investment bank, from uh, uh, different organization. We have 36 partners in the UN system, and they are focused really on the projects using artificial intelligence to, to give the people better life. 
This is one. And the second platform we are offering to, the, to our partners are um, World Summit for Information Society Forum, which is ICT for Development Forum, where including organizations or private person, NGO, can come and share their experience, their success stories on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, using ICT to improve the, uh, the life of the people. And this year, I I'd like to mention this year, that we have, uh, we, uh, participants has an have an opportunity to learn about IOM's inno Innovative Migrants as Messenger campaign project. And at the same time, uh, uh, they learn about uh, the initiative between G Geneva, University of Geneva and Tsinghua uh, University in China to explore how ICT can bridge the gap of an equal access to education for refugee children and youth in refugee camps and dis, uh, displaced communities. Uh, I'll stop here. I have some other examples, but I'll, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, actually, especially thank you for actually giving us a little bit more information on how connectivity is important, but at the same time, it's not covered the whole globe because we still have 50% of the population that do not have internet access. And then the spectrum management importance as well as uh, the forthcoming the conference in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, now I would like to pose another two questions to Sara and follow up to your already discussion that was actually developed. And uh, this is what is potential knowledge that can be generated on youth migration by looking at non traditional data sources? And how is migration viewed, uh, debated among the general public and youngsters in particular? I think actually, a colleague next to you started this debate, but uh, I would like to listen a little bit more about it. Thank you. And, um, Thank you also to Kathleen for this uh, interesting presentation. I just want to add that at the Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography, we are exploring conceptually how we can also use artificial intelligence to help uh, the backlog of, uh, of processing the backlog of asylum applications. But this is a very tricky issue. So conceptual, we are all thinking it conceptually. We did not start working, but uh, I would be also very curious to know your view on, on this type of application of artificial intelligence. Um, to come back on uh, how we can use non-traditional data to better understand migrant uh, youth migration, I want to give you uh, a concrete example of how we can use Facebook data uh, to estimate the stock of migrant uh, of of migrants in a, uh, in a country. Because Facebook can be uh, an example of how you can obtain data in a timely, low cost, and almost globally uh, available uh, manner. Uh, there is, so Facebook has this advertising platform, which is publicly available, that you can access and, um, and define your target population. So in our case, it would be a uh, youth population, for example, from 15 to 24 years of age. Uh, and we, uh, we can choose there the, that our target population are expats. This is what they used to call the, the migrants, expats. Now they adopted the label of persons living in a country X. But for the sake of clarity, let's uh, continue with the old label, expats. So we can interrogate Facebook and say, for example, how many young expats are there in the city of Geneva? Uh, Facebook will give us data for the uh, people aged above 14. So we do not have data on children, of course. Um, and they will give us the number only if our target group is higher than 1,000. So we get the aggregate data. We don't get individual data, so we do not have these privacy issues. We get aggregate data and only if they are about 1,000 units. So with my data, data scientists uh, from our team, we asked how many experts, young experts are there in Geneva. So yesterday's data was, uh, so we had, there were 46,000 uh, Facebook users uh, between, uh, aged between 14 and 25 in the city of Geneva, out of which 14,000 were experts. So in the city of Geneva, we have one out of three uh, are experts. Of course, this is not, this is a very, uh, let's say, raw data, which uh, uh, is then by the data, data scientists corrected. Um, we have this uh, algorithm that correct the bias and so on. 
but this is just to give you an example of how uh, we could use uh, big, uh, big data to understand, to estimate the stock of migrants. Besides Facebook, we also tried to explore the use of mobile phone data, uh, especially we did it to study uh, social and behavioral segregation in cities. Uh, then we started using also exploring uh, LinkedIn data for analyzing the educational attainment of recently arrived migrants, because we know that the data on recently arrived migrants is very hard to, uh, to obtain. Uh, so LinkedIn can be, for example, one way of, um, of uh, resolving this problem. Then we also explored the use of air passenger data to analyze the nexus between mobility and migration as to capture these type of fluent types of uh, migration. Of course, I'm always saying exploring because uh, there's so much to work to be done into understanding how to trick big data. And these real and potential limitations in using big data lie in the fact that the data are held by private sector. And uh, for example, we, we, we don't have clear definitions also on, for example, in the case of Facebook, how do they define experts? There are some scientific ways of predicting what they mean by experts, but they can even change it from one day and another. And until we realize what change in the definition, it could take a time. So we would not know is it a, trend in, a change in a trend or a change in a definition that uh, changed the numbers on the table. So that is why it becomes very important to create partnerships with private sectors that have data, uh, is to understand the definitions, the transparency issues, but also to create trust with them that they can, um, let's say, give us the, 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 the aggregate data, not, of course, process and everything by them, without uh, being afraid that they can be uh, used in an improper way. Uh, as for your second question, uh, since uh, it's kind of, it's a, it's a bit a different uh, point of view of how we can use social media again to understand migration. Since I am a scientist and I'm used to present with graphs and numbers, even here I had to put at least one graph. <laughs> so this is, um, this is a graph uh, from the standard Eurobarometer survey, which we uh, use very much. Uh, it gives uh, information on the views held by European citizens on a wide range of subjects, including migration. So here you can see attitudes toward migration from outside the EU by age cohort. And uh, so a person was asked, please tell me whether each of the following statements evoke a positive or a negative feeling for you, immigration of people uh, from outside the EU. So these lines represent the share of people that state that it, it evokes a very positive or a fairly positive um, um, uh, feeling. And we can see that young population from 15 to 24 years of age has a particularly positive attitude toward migration from non-EU uh, countries. And we see a wide uh, gap between uh, attitudes of older people toward migration, 45 years plus, which only 30% of them have a positive uh, view of migration. We do see another trend, however, that these attitudes toward migration are, um, let's say, becoming more positive over the years, although the gap between young and old still remain. And, um, in this context, for us, uh, it became also important to understand how these public uh, attitudes toward migrants are shaped on social media interactions. So what we did, this is a project that is still ongoing. Uh, I will just present to you one part of it. Uh, what we did is we started to collect tweets that contain keywords like migration, migrant, immigrant, emigrant. Um, I will talk to you about the collection that we did from June 2016 until November 2017. We collected 46.5 million tweets. So if you tweeted something about migration, you're probably in the collection. And uh, we looked of how we looked at the uh, mentionings and shares of these types of tweets. And uh, what we find uh, is a 
highly polarized discourses on migration. So for example, we had a, a community of conservatives uh, talking uh, about migration. Then we have another big community of, for example, Democrats in the case of the US talking about migration. And then we had also a, a community of experts, meaning scientists uh, and international organizations talking about migration. And what we saw actually that when we produce this, when we produce information about migration, we as experts, they are hardly, hardly reaching uh, other communities. For example, the communities of, of, of conservatives or the communi communities of Democrats. So basically, main part of discussions about migration, at least on Twitter, um, are, are done within the community. So there is not much sharing. So we have we face these uh, echo chambers. Uh, however, this is still an ongoing study. As I said, we continue to collect uh, with, with this collection. We included other words that we were missing, like refugees, asylum, and so on. And this collection ended in May 2019. So we can see also, we will be able to see how we talked about migration during the European elections. And I hope that soon I, I will be able to come back and, and talk what we what findings we made. Thank you. Thank you. I think the uh, research that uh, your team and you are doing are excellent and uh, will give us uh, actually confirm many things that we suspect, but give us a little bit more uh, food for thought. For uh, Mr. Carlo, I have one, uh, actually two more questions. And I think that I kind of a hand to hand what we just uh, listen. What are the implications of new research technologies in enhancing and our understanding of migration that dates? How can we better utilize big data to inform migration policy and practice? Uh, what recommendations do you have for governments and non-state actors at the local, national, international levels to counterparts to spread misinformation and subsequent increase at, in hate crime? Thank you very much uh, for the que these questions. And I want to also pick up where we basically stopped here and highlight basically the great advantages uh, social media data, for example, offer. While it takes, if you want to understand what questions uh, people are worrying about and how basically these debates are going in your society, conducting polls can take large amounts of time and basically also resources why you can get immediately real-time data for millions of people uh, and opinions and the movement on opinions over time as well as the locations of individual from social media networks as Facebook and Twitter and also in our research we've collected uh, data on millions of Twitter followers we have co collected more than a billion tweets from these followers and we know their friendship network so basically you can understand who these pe um, in which way these people are connected and in this way basically this allows us was, uh, in our research to study spikes in anti-minority sentiment on social media, but it also can shed light on any policy question and um, uh, even on the current debate and the state of the debate. I think it's, uh, it's still important to keep in mind that the opinions on social media um, are, will not be representative necessarily since groups are not... Uh, homogeneously uh, represented on social media, but we can still get a lot of information. And uh, I think also we can get specific information on individual target groups as social media companies have a lot of information on their users. So especially, especially Facebook, we can learn about uh, sub-communities uh, which might be of big interest. I think uh, where these challenges that come in is basically developing the capabilities to analyze on the one hand these and process the large amount of data and also um, the challenges of natural language processing. Because as soon as you're not talking about 100 tweets, but about 100 million tweets, of course it becomes prohibitively expensive to read all of them by hand. And you have to have basically these artificial um, intelligence systems and supervised machine learning classifiers that tell you something about the content of each tweet and allow you to track sentiment in these systems over time. But overall, um, uh, the data provided by social media and new information technologies uh, hold great promise to understand phenomena. And um, 
where basically I think the challenges come in is, as uh, just was highlighted, these social media communities are highly segregated. So while in real life societies, you from time to time still meet people of uh, different op points of view, on social media, social media companies through their filtering algorithm have designed a system that you will basically predominantly be exposed to opinions of a similar viewpoint and you will talk within your own sub-community. And um, due to the low barriers of entrance in social media, basically what we find in our research is that um, Again, basically, the right wing people talk to the right wing people, the people on the left talk to the people on the left, and there's very little interchange. And this, basically, as we know from decades of psychological research, leads to increases in polarization and more extreme opinions in the long run. And um, this is particularly a concern. And when it comes to our research, and basically what I've uh, heard when uh, talking about this research also with migrant communities, that uh, a concern for them is that uh, they are particularly targeted uh, or targets of online hate speech. And um, this, of course, can lead to their withdrawal from these communities and basically the disappearance from the public sphere, which is, of course, a concern. Um, and what our research then highlights is that basically the online and the offline world are connected. So these are not separate phenomena. Uh, and while basically we can learn a lot about online behavior, it will also be informative about offline action. And in our case, we looked at hate crime, but it also uh, is informative when it comes to political preferences, opinions, and other behavior. Um, just to offer a few points on basically how basically best to address these challenges, which is obviously uh, a mass, uh, basically a, a field of concern and probably also a field of ongoing research. And I think one thing I want to highlight is obviously that due to the interconnectedness of online and offline action, I think basically we, uh, in the end, if you want to find effective strategies of addressing online hate, uh, basically, there also has to be action uh, offline. While the development of effective counter narratives online and basically trying to desegregate the uh, segregated groups online might help uh, the spread of hate speech and the spread of hate crime, overall local action is demanded. And um, as a last note, I also want to ca uh, caution against basically easy fixes like censorship because it always might be tempting to now pass new laws to basically ban online hate speech or restrict the rules on what content is acceptable online. But, uh, but so far, basically, there's limited evidence that these actually provide uh, real solutions to this kind of problems. And therefore, I would, uh, as they come as a high cost, I would uh, caution against using them just too leniently. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nagdi, we have two more questions for you. Uh, you're, the, you're the founder of Benny, an online strategy st st storytelling platform to the rise youth. Uh, could you explain how, how your platform contributes to change of perception? Uh, what advice do you have for young people who might be seeking a community online? How can young people find a safe and supportive online environment? Or is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'd love to pick up where we left off in the previous, uh, my panelists said about echo chambers. That for me is like the crux of a lot of the work that I do is that how do we break down these echo chambers? Two practical examples from uh, my platform. My platform is a storytelling platform. I try to provide stories about people who are either second, third generation migrants growing up in the West or emerging migrants coming from the East from various war-torn countries. Um, I, in the beginning of my journey, I, I made a video called the British Happy Muslims video. I don't know if anybody might have seen it here, but it basically went super viral. Um, I had no previous experience of making a video, but what I had realized is that public perception of my community as a brown young Muslim man, growing up in the West was very negative at the time of a post 9-11 context. Um, the London bombings had happened and there was also negative sentiment floating around especially towards migrant communities in the UK. So I wanted to do a video. I had no previous background. This is when I was actually working at the UNHCR in Jordan. I'd come back to London, and I was flirting with the idea of doing something creative. And then I had a camera at home, never filmed a video in my life. 
And I was like, mm, let me try and film something that might be a little bit different. Pharrell came out with a song called Happy. I don't know if anyone's heard it before, but it, it was basically a, a huge viral uh, blockbuster hit. And I was like, it would be amazing to do a parody about migrant communities who are happy in the context in which they're living in. Filmed the video in about 10 days, um, released it. I expected about 1,000 people to watch the video, and 1,000 people was just my family alone. Um, then, literally overnight, it happened to get 1.7 million views. And this is from a, someone who's never made a video before in my life, and the comments flooded. My phone battery died in the matter of about 30 minutes. But the comments were majority, and this is where data came in, it was inc incredibly interesting to see the kind of social stats that were coming out of it. Majority of the comments were coming from people who didn't have a migrant background, um, a Western European, British um, communities, who suddenly felt like, oh my God, like this is incredible to see such an eclectic cosmopolitan community woven in the fabric of who we are as well. But, of course, as a result of that, to bring in the negatives of what social media can, can do, it got a lot of heat, it got a lot of negativity. Right-wing groups started to claim that these people are, this is some heated agenda of basically them trying to um, say that they are a part of who we are, but they're not, and it became a very actually quite uh, vitriolic, venomous campaign against migrants, which was probably about 10% of the people that watched it. It was overwhelmingly positive, but it was still brought about to the surface of how dangerous social media can be. And me, as the content creator, I felt responsible for providing a platform for these people that I put in the video. Suddenly, they were the uh, subjects of deep, horrible hate speech, basically. It was like comments that were basically like pinning out physical appearances, where people were from, insults that you would never say to anybody face to face. So in that moment, I was confronted with the positive and negatives of what I do in terms of storytelling. Then I realized, how can I do this in a more nuanced way that protected the communities that I was trying to represent? And this is where storytelling can, well, a nuanced approach to storytelling can be very useful in shaping identity. Identity of the migrant, but also identity, uh, shaping their or self-perception in the future and how they perceive themselves. I made a story about my grandmother, who was an Indonesian um, migrant, um, and she passed away when I was about three. I, had no, I, I didn't really know my Indonesian grandma at all. She was this weird phantom figure in the house where you kind of felt like you knew her, but you didn't because she was a beautiful picture of her in our house, but I never really knew her. Long story short, I went to Indonesia to find out about my roots and ended up finding family that I'd never met before. Huge emotional journey about a second, third culture young boy going back to his migrant roots. All of the comments, all of the feedback were from the same right-wing people commenting on this video, but instead of a negative approach, they were so incredibly positive and so incredibly comforting because instead of seeing me as some other, as some migrant trying to come into their country, they just saw a young boy who loved his grandmother who wanted to connect back to something, and that was a very relatable experience. And this is where nuanced approach to storytelling can really help bridge the divide between echo chambers. So when I'm trying to like bridge different communities together, I'm trying to see what is the intersection, what is the commonality between someone like me coming from a decorated cultural background or lots of different influences to um, homogenous indigenous communities in the West. What is the kind of intersection that we can connect with each other? And in that story, it was the love of an unconditional love of a grandmother and her sacrifices that she made for her future generations. And the difference was stark. It was incredible. Um, and now that's how I tend to go about my future storytelling. I start with intersection. I start with the cross between different cultures. And that, from my experience as a practitioner on social media, is a great way if you're trying to bridge the divides between echo chambers, which can be very prevalent in the social media space. Thank you. It's very inspiring the, the way also how you present, but also referring to the, your developing as a storyteller. Uh, it's, it's on Ben's YouTube channel, right? Who, who didn't see it? Yeah, I didn't. I, then that's there. Uh, before we open the floor uh, to, the, to all of you, I, first, I would like to ask each of you, do you have any message? Do you have any recommendation on anything else that you would like to uh, address today and you still didn't think it's not uh, addressed? Let's start then first with the Deputy Minister. Please, go ahead. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, 
impresionante historia y creo que nos lleva a la corresponsabilidad que nos corresponde a todos. Eh, a pesar de lo bonito que les he comentado, en Costa Rica tuvimos, que es considerado el, ha sido considerado el país más feliz del mundo en varias ocasiones, eh, tuvimos algún brote de xenofobia hace año y medio. Eh, tuvo que ver con el incremento de, de las solicitudes o de los ingresos de las personas nicaragüenses. Eh, fue pequeño, fueron tal vez 50 personas, pero fueron, eh, y eso fue muy impactante. Creo que aquí hay una lección aprendida y fue una muy rápida reacción del presidente liderando y, y, y dejando muy claro que eso no es Costa Rica y muchos otros mensajes, los expresidentes salieron también y creo que aquí en estos momentos también es clave que cada quien, lo decía Nadir, desde, desde su plataforma, el gobierno desde su mm, posición y cada uno pues tome estas decisiones rápidamente, porque también el tiempo importa cuando estamos en situaciones críticas. Entonces, creo que eso es muy importante, tener una clara posición, un claro liderazgo y confrontar estas situaciones de, básicamente de raíz. Igual se, eso se había gestado mucho por, eh, por Facebook, creo. Entonces, se identificaron muchos perfiles falsos, se identificaron de cuáles páginas venía, pero bueno, hubo una rápida acción al respecto y bueno, no hemos tenido más eh, manifestaciones de estas. Eh, y también el tema del, del acceso a la conectividad, lo cierto es que eso es un reto muy importante, yo les he contado las cosas que hemos estado haciendo, pero sigue siendo un reto para Costa Rica tener el mejor acceso a la conectividad para las personas para que puedan hacer el buen uso correspondiente. Para eso también, pues eh, básicamente decirles que tenemos muchas ganas de hacer las cosas bien eh, y que eh, en realidad básicamente… Quisiéramos ser también un laboratorio de buenas prácticas, más allá de las que tenemos. Para eso la articulación con la cooperación ha sido muy importante, como les mencionaba antes, con OIM y OIT. Pero quisiéramos también eh, decirles que tenemos todo el compromiso y las ganas de, de trabajar por la población migrante y que estaremos abiertos a hacerlo de una forma pues, articulada y que realmente beneficie a las personas que son finalmente nuestras nuestra razón de ser. Gracias. Thank you. Mr. Kalkin, do you have any message from IT side? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> um, we, we, we should, all of us, we acknowledge that for youth now is the most exciting and most challenging time. The internet provides them the possibility to access more information, to be more educated, to develop their own business, and we have some examples here in the panel to develop their own business. But we should, all of us, we should realize that together with the possibilities uh, given by the new technology, we should come with responsibility. And it was what the minister underlined here. And I'm sure that all together, multi-stakeholder, not only the governments, together with the youth, together with the businesses, we can respond to the challenges of the future. And we should have more and more not only discussion, but common project. And as an international organization, what we can offer are uh, platforms where all together can come developing projects. And this is what we'll do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Gubano Boshkovic, please. Uh, so I give you some examples of how we can use big data, but actually I'm here also to, to, to to promote that we need to, uh, the, the great potential that this big data have in harnessing uh, uh, data, of big data for migration. And, but to do so, so we cannot use Facebook data as it is now. We really, really, really need to build partnerships with private sectors that have this data. So I would like, uh, to take this occasion also to uh, ask IOM maybe in the next uh, dialogue if we can have also the private sector so they can also tell us what are their, uh, their problems <laughs> with, uh, 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 with give making this type of data available also to governments in a systematic way. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schwartz. 
Yeah, I, I want to also conclude on a maybe po more positive note and basically in, in the end effect, basically social media, all new technologies and while they now have been around for more than a decade, it took basically uh, more than 70 years until people agreed that cars might need seat belts. And this is similar basically the way I think about social media. I think there's still a lot of ongoing research and we are trying to understand this new phenomenon of fake news, echo chamber, and how to best to tackle them. And it's great that we have this panel here bringing different expertise together. But in the end, probably it's going to take a bit more years until basically we have found basically a better setup for these social medias. But in the end, my hope is that over time, basically we will have the opportunity to make use of all the chances and advances these new information technologies provide us, and that in the end we can use them in the way that actually brings people together uh, all around the globe. I think, and this would be, I think, a great, uh, uh, great uh, thing if we can finally manage uh, to connect people through these new information technology channels and social media. Thanks. And uh, least but not last, uh, Nardi. Thank you. Um, I guess I'd include, just to say, on the issue of social media, as a practitioner, as someone deeply um, invested in the uh, migration space, that uh, for me, social media is like a knife. You can use it to make yourself food. You can use it to hurt somebody. It's the tool, and ultimately, um, it's the person behind the tool that we're interested in. How are we cultivating young people who are morally conscientious, but also proactive in the spaces that they're operating in? I operate in a space of culture. I believe culture is the way forward, especially for people with migrant backgrounds, because culture gives you something to live for. Um, growing up as a migrant, you have to navigate multiple cultures simultaneously. It's a very difficult space to be in. But what the, what, when you provide a platform, you provide a space, and you give a voice to a young person, a young migrant, who felt like they'd never had one, and we might give them a voice, but usually those voices are picking at them at their lowest common denominator, which is, you are a migrant, tell me your story, of how you suffered in your life as a migrant. But once you provide a real voice where you hear the entirety of this person's essence, this characteristics, their personalities, their hopes, their aspirations, you provide them a platform that hears their truest voice, you inspire young people that feel invested in the community that they're part of. And that's where nuance comes in. Social media has been part of our lives now for almost 10 years. It's past the beta phase, it's past the 1.0, it's evolving, it's changing to mean and encompass more of our lives every single day, it's not gonna go anywhere but we need to become a lot more nuanced and detailed with how we approach our communities and allowing them to feel like they have a vested interest and a stake in the stories that ab are about them ultimately. Um, just to close, I would, as a practitioner, as the only one here, I think, um, I would love to see something a bit more proactive in the sense that I know me and myself and the community of influencers and social media people that I know, we would love to work more proactively with people in this room. And I know that I can, I know that if like a collective existed or a body of like social media people around the world who represented demographs from lots of different diverse backgrounds, um, they would be more than willing to help provide their platforms to help organizations like yourselves. Um, and I would love to see something like materialize, like a body, a collective, a youth-led organization that leveraged their influence into really meaningful things under the watchful eye of people like the IOM or other international organizations. But just to throw an idea out there or the energy out there, so hopefully something like that materializes, but thank you for the time. Thank you for your suggestion, I'd certainly do follow up. Uh, now we are actually opening the floor for the questions, comments and suggestions. In this moment we already have one that is lined up, uh, and this is represented for European Public Law Organization, Ambassador George Papa Dotau, head of the mission, uh, please. Uh, thank you. My appreciation and thanks to the panelists for their contribution. My question relates to the references made to ILO, the future of work and artificial intelligence. There are growing indications and evidence that artificial intelligence is already taking away low paying jobs. And these are the jobs that migrants compete for due to low investment in human capital, skills, and so forth. It, so, it also so happens that uh, the jobs are the ones that the um, unions are trying to protect. So the unions are facing two threats. One is 
from artificial intelligence, the other is from migrants. I, I am wondering how can this challenge be reconciled or has anybody given some thought to that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think this is uh, referring to Mr. Kathleen. No, I, I think it's more referring on ILO, on the International Labour Organization, because uh, it, it, it was referring about, about that. But what I can say is that we are in a changing world due to the new technologies. Artificial intelligence is one of them. We should understand that. We cannot stop the technological development. We should understand that and we should create adaptable instruments for the new era. And I already gave this example that we are working in international labor organization together on a digital skills for desert job campaign. Because we need to understand that for the future jobs, th there will not be the same jobs as we have, as Ambassador said. Will not, some of the jobs that we have now will be replaced, and, but new jobs will be, will be created and we need to be prepared. And especially the youth are the ones we should give them this tool, these skills to be prepared for the future. It's, it is a way how we answer to, to the new challenge. It's one of the biggest challenge. We don't know. And if it's someone from ILO, maybe can answer more on this question. I think uh, somebody would like to from floor to add something. I think all of us now, especially us, us who are has a parent, who are a parent and have a kids that actually now on to decide about their future, it's very difficult now to even to to advise. Uh, and not only to advise what kind of a profession somebody should select, not even kind of a basic or elementary study should select, because we are don't know actually about uh, new jobs that will be created. And in that sense, uh, we will have uh, on the uh, today, tomorrow actually, and one of the panels have ILO representative, and we can actually reiterate this question and probably get a little bit more from ILO. And in this moment, uh, Mr. Schwartz would like to add something. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, not necessarily only for my own research, but uh, by training I'm an economist. Uh, so basically we've obviously studied uh, studies on AI and the impact of automation on these jobs. And I think, that, I think that it's not true uh, that the, the impact of AI will be concentrated in low paying jobs. AI will be placed or basically substitute a lot of jobs where basically humans are not willing to pay a bonus for basically having human interactions. So uh, if you are basically um, working in elderly care, your uh, job is going to be safe, while when you work at a, basically as an air traffic controller, which is a very high paying, high skilled job, your job might be gone in 20 years. And I think uh, that I completely agree with the challenge and basically in the end, it basically will see tremendous productivity increases because of increase in artificial intelligence. What matters in the end is basically how we manage them and how we are able to distribute basically the changes in productivity and compensate those that will uh, lose from artificial intelligence and set them onto a path and basically help them to acquire new skills uh, to succeed in basically in a world where artificial intelligence is basically automating away more and more professions. Madam Alvarez. Gracias. Efectivamente, coincido no solo con lo dicho por los panelistas, sino con el planteo de la consulta. Eh, en el caso de Costa Rica, y probablemente esto dependa mucho de cada una de las economías, eh, en el recien, la reciente medición que hubo del comportamiento del empleo, si bien se crearon ciento, casi 200 mil empleos nuevos, 